So at my, after my ordination, um, I received some gifts from different people. Uh, I had a family friend that uh, gave a gift, and I, I don't think they're watching this, so I, if they are, then that's okay. I'm sure they'll understand. Uh, they gave me this gift of these wooden coasters. They had just gotten into, what is that, wood burning, right, where you can write messages and quotes on a wooden surface, with like a hot pen, you know. And uh, they know that I, you know, like the occasional beer, right, and you know, have a good time. And, and so they made me this, these coasters, which I still use to this day, but they had some really interesting quotes on all of them. Some of them were like John Wayne quotes, um, but this one in particular, it didn't say who, who, who said this, but it said, beer makes you sleep easy, easy sleep makes you not sin, not sinning gets you into heaven. That was a little, a little strange message there. So I was interested, I was like, where did, this, where did this come from? So I looked it up, and mind you, this was a gift given to a man on the eve of his ordination to the Catholic priesthood, and lo and behold, Martin Luther was the one who said this. So I thought it was pretty interesting. And something kind of, there's like an uneasiness within me with that, that statement, right? Not sinning gets you into heaven. Because my experience throughout life has been overcoming that knowledge, overcoming that understanding of Christianity. Christianity and Christian living and Christian morality is not about not sinning. I know we have the sacrament of reconciliation available, so that seems like it's flying in the face of that statement. But at its core, Christianity is not about avoiding sin. Christianity and Christian living, Christian morality is about adherence to the presence of God. Adherence to the person of Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary to that. If that happens, if I love God with my whole heart as we hear in the Gospels, then we will follow the commandments. We will, we will avoid sin. We will avoid those things that lead us away from him. But our, pre our focus should not be on the good things that we do or the bad things that we do. We're not going to earn salvation by our virtue, though we're called to be virtuous because we have encountered the living God and we want to adhere ourselves to him. Right? And we also know that Jesus has the final word over sin and death. If we adhere ourselves to him and worship him and have him be the center of our lives, then everything else will follow and will fall into place. With this concept in mind, then we can try to understand the readings today, especially the first reading from Genesis and our gospel today, this famous passage of Martha and Mary, which has been a thorn in my side throughout my whole life uh, because I'm very much a Martha, right? And I think, unfortunately, I th maybe my own understanding for many years has been a simplistic one, right? Where Jesus is saying, you know, you should have the contemplative life and avoid the active lifestyle, right? But I don't think that's what he's saying. And I think the church calls our attention to the fact that Jesus is probably not just giving that simplistic message by giving us this first reading. Because at the face value, when we see the first reading, we see Abraham doing everything that Martha's doing. Right? Abraham is busying himself as, you know, showing hospitality. We just had the feast of St. Benedict recently who made that the center of his rule of life for his brothers, for the monks as he established these monasteries. They should be places of hospitality because first and foremost, when we are hospitable to another person, when we welcome them, we are welcoming the presence of God. This is what Abraham was doing. We see the very first three words of our first reading today, the Lord appeared. The Lord appeared to Abraham. And it's interesting because previous to this, we know that Abraham has failed in his relationship with God. He has forgotten the promise that, that God made him, that he said you will be a blessing to generations. Right? He has forgotten this. The first time we see that he forgets this is when he laughs. He says he falls down and laughs in the face of God when he is told that his wife will be with child. He laughs out of incredulity, right? He's out 99 years old, how can I have a child? And he falls and he fails, and, that, and that's why he's laughing. Even the, the name Isaac, I know we have some Isaacs here today, means he who laughs, right? Because God used that laughter and blessed it, right? And gave that fruitfulness. The second time Abraham fails 
and he falls again on his face, right? We all fall on our faces many times in our own failures. The second time he fails is out of infidelity to his wife, right? We know the whole story of Hagar when he is infidel, unfaithful to Sarah, his wife, and the whole story of Isaac and Ishmael. But today we see that Abraham falls on his face in the presence of the Lord after the Lord appears to him out of adoration and out of worship. Right? It's very interesting. It says the Lord appeared to Abraham, but then we hear there's these three men that are there. And Abraham's reply, and as Christians, our, our, uh, our ears should perk up when we hear this. And it says the Lord appeared, and then there's three men. Wait a second. The Lord appeared in three men, and then, he's, and then Abraham's reply is, Sir, in the singular, Sir, if I may ask you this favor, please do not go on past your servants. This image in scripture is, uh, Rublev was a Russian iconographer, and he made this beautiful icon of the Trinity using this scene from Genesis of these three men, these three angels that are revealing the Lord to Abraham. And Abraham is sitting and waiting for the Lord's appearance after he's seen his own sinfulness, his own weakness, and he's waiting for the opportunity to bow down and prostrate himself before the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because he recognizes that God has to be central to his life. God has to be at the center of everything that he does. God has to be the foundation of everything that Abraham does. And only then can he busy himself with caring for the needs of these visitors, with service. In the gospel, we see this beautiful, right? We, we, we know Jesus often as our savior. We know Jesus as God in the flesh, as the second person of the Trinity, as the Lord of the cosmos, as the Lord of the world. But Jesus also reveals himself in today's gospel as a friend as a friend who gently reminds his friends of the right behavior, of the right posture of the disciple. He says, Martha, Martha, right? This double usage of her name. You can just hear it, Martha, Martha. You're anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Martha, Martha. Maybe you can hear your own name in that as Jesus is saying this today. Bill, Bill. Jessica, Jessica, you are worried about many things, but there is only one thing you need to concern yourself with, and Mary is playing that part. Just as Abraham had prostrated himself at the feet of these visitors, Mary is sitting at the feet, lowering herself, recognizing who is in front of her, recognizing that this is the man who has changed her life. This is the man who gives meaning and purpose to her life, new direction, this is the man who has to be at the center of everything that she does. And God is trying to remind Martha of that. Not that, you know, we are all called to be contemplative in the world. You know, there's, there's aspects of that, but that's a simplistic reading. We have to recognize that God is at the center of everything that we do. And maybe you're here today and you're like, but yeah, there's a lot of things to get done. <laughs> There's a lot of worries that I have in my heart. There's a lot of anxieties that are weighing upon me. I am worried about many things. I am worried about many things. Maybe you're worried about the school year coming up and trying to get your kids and grandkids ready. Maybe you're worried about the state of, of the world and the country. Maybe you're worried about finances and with all the inflation going on. Maybe you're worried about illness and sickness within your family, how to care for someone. Jesus is telling, to you, telling you today, Place me first, place me at the center, and then everything else will fall into place. Everything else will attain meaning and purpose. Everything else will be healed. But I want you, I want you, I want your heart, and I want you to recognize that I am here with you in the midst of it all. I am here with you, not just, God is not just a thing amongst many other things. He is the very ground of existence, the very ground of being itself. That's a very, that's the, that's the principle of Thomistic philosophy and theology. That's the principle of, 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 of what we believe as Christians. That God is not just the greatest of all things in the hierarchy of things, but he, as we heard last week in the, in the first letter of Paul to the Colossians, through him all things came into being and were made. Through him all things are held together. All things are through him, for him, and with him. 
And that's all things are even your anxieties and your fears and your worries and even your sins. He heals that and gives that new meaning and new direction and new purpose. So whether you come here today with many anxieties, many maybe you're struggling with loss, struggling with you know, what's going on? How am I going to feed my family this next week? How am I living pay t- paycheck to paycheck? How is this going to work out? Place God in the middle of that and allow him to make order out of chaos. Allow him to give that new meaning and new direction. We have many opportunities here for you as a parish to help you in that endeavor. Right? Whether it's just coming home from work and you pass by here to spend 10 minutes in our, our adoration chapel, we have adoration available 24-7, whether that's the middle of the night or on your way home from work, just to spend five or 10 minutes and say, Lord, I've got many fears. I've got many anxieties right now. I've got many problems. And even if it's just you yelling that out to him, that's fine. He can handle it. He's the ground of everything. He's the ground of all that exists, even those worries. So if you need the code to the Adoration Chapel, please approach one of us after Mass, one of our staff members or hospitality members, and we'll get that for you. This evening and most Sundays, unless we announce otherwise, we have Sunday night Lectio Divina, where we gather in adoration of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament for an hour and look at the gospel for the next week, allowing God's word to speak into our lives, into our concrete existence, bringing everything that we're going through to meet Jesus and his word so that he may give us truth in those places where maybe we believe lies, where those lies have created anxiety and fear in us. We have some men's and women's retreats coming up. Actually, not some. We have one men's retreat and one women's retreat coming up in the next couple of months in August and September, which is a great opportunity to allow the Lord to give him that time to sit at his feet, to prostrate ourselves in adoration of him, recognizing him as the center of our lives, of reordering our lives, and just taking that time to be with him and allow him to work on our hearts. And we have many other opportunities coming up soon as well that are going on now that are coming up soon to help you in this endeavor to pl- so that you can place everything at the feet of Jesus, that you may fall down and worship of him and recognize that he is the center of everything. So Christian, Christianity, the call that we have to live as disciples is not simply about measuring up to Jesus of our good efforts and our bad efforts but it's an encounter with a person. It's an adherence to him of making him the center of everything, of making him the one thing that is necessary.